Okay, so this is a screencast over chapter 30, uh, the portion of the unit or chapter that covers the events in China, uh, in particular the fall of the Qing Dynasty and what ends up happening with a nationalist China and then the communist movement that ends up in civil war. Uh, by the time we'd gotten to 1900, the last time we had studied China, we saw the Boxer Rebellion, which if you remember was a uprising in China against Christians and foreigners and even Chinese Christians that was put down brutally uh, by a multinational uh, faction from several different countries and some within China. Uh, and that was the last time we had studied uh, the, what was going on in China and that was 1905. And now we're creeping into what's happened uh, during or building up to the First World War, what went on right after the First World War. But to start again there in 1905 with the Boxer Rebellion, uh, there was a foreign presence that many Chinese resented. Uh, and there are still Chinese within China that are torn against each other. Some think that China needs to modernize. Uh, others think nationalism could save China. Still others believe China uh, is a very proud and traditional place and that's where their greatness lies. So what happens with the fall of the Qing Dynasty is the arrival of Chinese nationalists. And I would tell you, you need to uh, click on these embeds uh, so that you get a better understanding. But the Chinese nationalists are called, that's pronounced the Kuomintang. Uh, and their founder is this man, Sun Yat-sen, uh, or Sun Yat-sen. Uh, this is a successful overthrow. Now note the year in 1911. This is still building up to the First World War. Uh, but to remind you, right, the Boxer Rebellion had failed, but had certainly signaled a, its changes were coming. It was the, that Boxer Rebellion was the really the death knell for the Qing Dynasty. Now, Sun Yat-sen is a very interesting figure because he had spent many years in the United States, uh, meaning he had been Western educated. And his idea for a modern China, right, there were varying ideas about what a modern China or what China should do in order to uh, advance itself, but that Sun was going to base his government and modern government off of three things nationalism meaning and foreign control that foreign control that we had been studying from imperialism uh, and that you will also see is still present after the first world war that this ought to have an element of people's rights and we're talking about democracy and in china that's that's a really interesting concept considering this is such a a traditional place of eastern tr uh, values and culture uh, democracy is a completely western form and one that is still uh, relatively new considering you know the the events of history of the hundred and 25 years or so uh, of American 1776 and the French in 1789 and what had developed uh, during all those democratic movements that we studied in the revolutions of 1848. So for Sun Yat-sen to embrace the idea that one of the reforms would be democracy is very interesting. At the same time, he's talking about another tenant being people's livelihood, land reform in China. Warlords essentially dominated the regions and their primary objective was the secure of their own land and their own armies. So that idea of land reform might sound like a Marxist socialist idea. This is not Marxism. This is more like ending warlord control over land. Uh, now there are challenges. China is uh, geographically vast and a population that is huge. And again, a very ancient culture. And there is difficulty in uh, Sun Yat-sen's movement. Uh, it's just simply easier to destroy the old than to build new, as you've seen several times in this year. Uh, so what ends up happening is a, a segment of a civil war. Uh, again, warlords had controlled the armies and the land and the situation in China was fairly desperate when the First World War started. Sun Yat-sen decides to out to, to come out in favor of and decide with the allies, but he's, they're not much help. Uh, what he was really hoping to do was to side with the allies and in return, uh, as we saw say with native Indian troops and like with the women's movement that by demonstrating a loyalty that on the other end, Western nations would give control of China back to the Chinese. Uh, well, we talked about what happened at the Treaty of Versailles was those big three closed the doors and settled everything. And what ends up happening is what is called the May 4th movement. So May 4th, 1919, word of the Treaty of Versailles gets to a mass of students. And we've seen student activity lead to revolution before, and we'll see it again. 
but there is a gathering of 3,000 angry students in Peking. These are Western educated students, and they are particularly frustrated with the Versailles Treaty because not only did uh, these foreign countries not give up their territorial control, uh, you know, Shanghai, for example, with the British, uh, they even extended German territories and gave them to the Japanese, which really is insulting and frustrating. What was the whole point of the war? Again, I would tell you to click on that May 4th movement in the slideshow. Uh, and what ends up happening is the protests spread and become a nationalist movement. This is not a full revolution yet, but they are spreading. At the same time, a communist party is growing in China. Uh, that allied humiliation left scars and many people turned away from Sun Yat-sen and his Western style of democracy and instead turned to a very close geographic neighbor, uh, Lenin and the communism that was coming out of the Soviet Union. And what's interesting is Lenin was actually willing to help uh, the nationalist government. Uh, China and the Soviets had common enemies, mainly the foreign influence. Uh, and by the time we got to the 1920s, right, the Soviets had just finished their civil war and Lenin is staunchly in control. Uh, Lenin had sent military help to the nationalists who were trying to drive out uh, the warlord control. Uh, but the Chinese had effectively also set up a communist party. And at first, the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese communists worked together because they wanted to rid themselves of foreign control and they wanted to eliminate the influence of warlords. What happens in the middle 1920s is Sun Yat-sen dies and his brother-in-law, this embed there that you should click on, is a major figure and he's also in your slideshow. This is Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, he becomes the ruler of China through the nationalist movement. And if you are, if there, there are people that would tell you that Chiang Kai-shek was the rightful ruler and others would tell you that his legacy is filled with brutality and militarism, that he was a military dictator. Um, either, either way that history analyzes it, he becomes the leader of the nationalist movement in China and the leader of China. Uh, now he is supported by communists, but Chiang Kai-shek does not trust the communists. Uh, he doesn't agree with the communist goal of a socialist economy. Uh, but again, they both want to get rid of the warlords. They both want to do their best to get rid of foreign influence. So after working with the communists to oust the warlords, he turn, Chiang Kai-shek turns on the communists. Uh, he actually, there's this very bold move into Shanghai where he gathers all these communist leaders and trade union members and uh, and in other cities, all in kind of one fell swoop, and starts uh, having them killed, and the remaining communists go into go into hiding, uh, and that is effectively Chiang Kai-shek becoming the president of the Nationalist Republic of China, uh, and that therefore that's why many believe he was a military dictator and a brutal, uh, uh, maybe even a warlord himself. Leading the communists is a uh, you cannot escape this man culturally. You know, I sometimes say in class, I, I want to protect you from ever sounding stupid. Uh, I want to make sure you can sound smart, too. Uh, you need to know who Chairman Mao is. Uh, there is no communist China without Chairman Mao. And again, we're not talking about ancient history. You can note the date next to his name. He died in 1976. Well, that was the year before I was born. Um, Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao, is somebody that you would have to be able to speak to in order to be able to demonstrate knowledge of what happened in China. And certainly what to understand what, even what's happening there today. Again, there is no communist China without Mao Zedong. Uh, you know, the, to pardon my segue there, but what did, where, where was the influence of the communists? Well, the nationalist government had made promises. Uh, and again, people might have viewed Chiang Kai-shek as a military dictator because they had made those promises about democracy and political rights. And as time passed, those promises went unfulfilled, and in fact, they became less democratic, and they became more corrupt. And if you spoke out, people were jailed or killed. Uh, and city people were uh, helped by schools and factories and hospitals, but rural peasants didn't get any help at all. And by consequence, they turned to the communists and their leader, Mao Zedong. And because Chiang Kai-shek is uh, essentially hunting them down, they have to run. They're on the run. They, they flee to the countryside, and they end up developing their own brand of communism. Now, if you remember in the Soviet Union, uh, Lenin talked about a dictatorship of the proletariat and the idea that the workers of the world would uh, throw off the chains and uh, lead the revolution. 
Uh, Mao is talking about a rural country, a peasantry that would be the revolutionaries, not urban laborers. Uh, so civil war breaks out and it is a, a as we've seen in many uh, parts of our year, uh, the civil war is brutal. Uh, the And quite honestly, it would not look like uh, if you were taking bets, as it were, it wouldn't look like the communists have that much of a chance, right? The nationalists have the military, the nationalists have the urban centers, uh, the nationalists could get and have some foreign support. Uh, but this civil war is brutal. And what the communists do is essentially run and hide and run and hide and run and hide and run and hide. They, they use guerrilla warfare. They use the mountains and the, and the challenging geography to retreat, harass, attack, retreat, harass, pursue. And while they're doing that, because they're in the rural countrysides in the mountains, they are earning uh, the respect of the peasantry in those regions. So at times when the war would simmer or when they would enter villages, they would assist the peasants. Uh, and the, these, these peasants end up uh, finding an affection for these communists that are fighting the nationalists that had never helped them. Uh, so more and more, these peasants joined what, you know, Mao's Red Army. And you get, there is a, this is a decisive moment. Uh, and there is an embed here that you should click on to follow. And it's a little more in depth. It's not just a Wikipedia page, but you should give that a second and read over it. Uh, if you're studying Chinese history and the Chinese Civil War and the rise of communism in China, there is no not studying this moment, the Long March. Uh, if you could imagine trying to study the French Revolution but not studying the fall of the Bastille, uh, it would be impossible. You know, we're going to study the American Revolution. We're not going to study the Declaration of Independence. This is a seminal event in the Chinese Civil War and in uh the lore of chinese communism the long march is a brutal event um chiang kai-shek comes after the communists with all he's got with an army of half a million men and what they do is they surround essentially surround the mountains and start moving in and what mao Zedong and his men realize is that the the an open battle is, is basically hopeless and so what they do is they spend really the next year just trying to survive uh and it's complicated to get specific details because you know they don't keep particular records but this event did occur uh what you see is a hundred thousand start out on what is essentially a six thousand mile hike every day staying one step ahead of chang's chiang kai-shek's forces they travel at night uh they hide during the day uh and of those hundred thousand it's again difficult to tell. Some some sources say they marched as much as eight thousand miles. If you know, if you want to look it up, I think you're talking about going from New York to San Francisco and back in the course of a year. And of those hundred thousand, some say as as few as ten thousand. Some say as many as thirty thousand uh, survived. That's that's uh, and it's it's this kind of event that they lean on as showing strength and solidarity and their ability to survive and the fact that the nationalists couldn't take them out. Uh, and that gained new followers. Uh, now what's happened is you're creeping into the middle 1930s. You might already be aware that the Second World War is right around the corner. Uh, so even while they've been fighting the Civil War and the communists have barely survived and the nationalists have been chasing them, what they've effectively done is rendered themselves vulnerable. And in the mid 1930s, Japan invades China, and that is, that's the start of the Second World War in in the Pacific theater. Uh, you know, when Japan starts pushing its way into China, uh, this is about the same time that in Germany Hitler is solidifying the Nazi Party, taking over the Reichstag, and planning to undo the Versailles Treaty. Uh, and so this this long march has a lot of uh, influence in China still today. This is a big piece. And it's also a big piece of studying the understanding of the Second World War as it starts in uh, Asia.